Pond. He is DJ Schweitzer. I am Jeremy Lance. Hi. Yeah, we're Limited. recording. Yeah, we're finally recording. We have a little bit of audio issues before we started here. You know, you'd think we'd have it figured out in year nine. Maybe. Yeah, but it's been so long that we've been trying to get this thing going that Jeremy's now having a snack. What you enjoying over there? Um, A Little Debbie Christmas tree. It's in the season? Tis the season. Yeah, we're past Halloween, so that means we've moved in on the... Uh, what I've seen this meme doing the rounds where it's like, we can give up the fight or the war against Christmas when Christmas stops illegally occupying the month of November. I think it's got squatters' rights at this point. <laughs> yeah, really. Just it's gonna butt its way through Thanksgiving eventually, and we're just gonna have just a month of of Christmas ultimately. Yeah, I don't know why every year people get confused by this. The holiday season, guys. It's the holiday season. You can celebrate all of them at any time. So I'm celebrating two months of Christmas. <laughs> Within that will be Thanksgiving. Sure. It will get its appropriate Thanksgivingness. Mm-hmm. I will enjoy that day. I will watch famous Christmas or uh, Thanksgiving movies like uh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles and nothing else. Okay, fair. <laughs> I mean, that 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 is kind of also the argument, right? Like, there's Christmas decorations. There's Christmas trees. There's Christmas music. There's Christmas movies. Can you say the same thing about Thanksgiving? There's a bird. Like, do you want Macy's to be playing Thanksgiving music right now? Like, what even? What even is that? I don't know. It, it just kind of feels like it's been overlooked. It's the redheaded stepchild of holidays. Nobody is overlooking Thanksgiving. I mean, it's. I. I don't feel like it's getting its proper due here. We're not sitting here eating Thanksgiving cakes right now, are we? Well, if they had them, I would have bought them. Right. Some turkey-shaped uh, yeah. Little Debbie cakes. Maybe that's that's what you're supposed to do, is just have turkey the whole month. <laughs> just the just entire month. turkey all month Nothing long. Nothing but turkey. I'm sick. I'm sick to death of turkey. Um, well, this has now become a, a, a holiday podcast. Finally. Next up, we'll be tackling Kwanzaa. Got nothing on that one. Yeah, this I really don't Third either. rail. What about Festivus? Um, yeah, I'm in. Okay, we, we could probably get into that one. Uh, but no, this week we are going to talk about soccer before we get into our uh, transition to the holiday podcast and uh-huh. maybe a, a whole episode on Little Debbie Cakes is coming. What is your favorite Little, little Debbie snack? You don't have to go Christmas, just your favorite Little Debbie snack. Hmm. Does it have to be Little Debbie? I mean, that is the frame yeah. that we've given uh, here. I'll get maybe like Hostess or something okay, like that. Okay, yeah. I would do like fudge rounds, I think, are probably my uh, my little Debbie of choice. Yeah, those are really good. Mm-hmm. Oh, my mom's favorite, so we always had those just around the house growing up. Yeah. Um, I was uh, I was a Star Crunch guy. Okay. Big Star Crunch Those guy. are really good, but I feel like after a while, your jaw would hurt from like getting at them. Oh, I mean, you did. You've got to put some effort in. There's a lot of effort yeah. necessary to enjoy that snack. There's there's some heavy lifting in that. My mom's a, an East Coast family. She she hails from Philadelphia, so okay. uh, she's big into uh, tasty cakes, and we see those around here a, a little bit. I just remember tasty cakes from when um, uh, Twinkies went away, and tasty cakes. There was like a Twinkie shortage, or Twinkies went away there for a bit. Yeah, they like and they, Tasty Cakes came in, like tried to fill the gap with their version of Twinkies, mm-hmm. which were like fine, whatever. I mean, they're basically the same thing, but it was like they just saw that gap you? in the market and they're like, "Don't worry, guys, <laughs> we got this. We've got you covered." <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, they have some really good ones uh, that are absolutely delicious. But uh, yeah, let's get into the soccer though, because it's been a wild weekend. Of things have happened. After the weekend included as well, it's been it's just been quite the whirlwind, um, and it's been very centered on my club, which you know is, yeah. is both good and bad, I suppose. But well, it's it's interesting. We at the weekend, the marquee match was Spurs and Manchester United, mm. a team in crisis versus a team that was you know really going through the motions at the moment. There, yeah. Spurs had some really just. Uh, Tepid results, even struggling in their uh, freshman uh, competition that they're in. Oh, the conference league. Right. Because yeah. it's not JV. 
It's like the junior. It's like the junior high team that gets to play on Tuesdays. Yeah, last week you described it as uh, the the freshman baseball team yeah. of of European leagues. Um, you guys, I mean, you guys were even struggling in that a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it's accurate. Lost to Vitesse. Uh, things were going not great, but like I, it wasn't like the panic button wasn't hadn't been hit yet, like it had been. For United. Yeah, I mean... Like, the United... Like, the panic button had been hit, right? You know, it's weird. I think if you look... I, th- from a wider perspective, I would agree with that, right? Like, um, everyone in the world knew that Manchester United... Like, ever, the eyes of, of the world were on Ole this weekend, mm-hmm. right? Like, what's he going to do, right? And I think I said this last week, too. Like, this is the perfect setup game for Manchester United. Like, of course, Spurs were going to lose this. Like... It was the part, like, United had been atrocious for the last few matches. Like, all the attention in the world was on, like, their manager. It was the perfect Spurs bogey game. Like, Mm -hmm. written all over it. And going into the match, I think everyone was kind of like, ole, ole, ole. Another big match where if they he slips up, like, yeah, could this be the death nail? Yeah. but Pretty fresh off that Liverpool debacle. Yeah, but, but... from the inside perspective, like, I I am keenly plugged into, like, Spurs Twitter. I'm sure you're kind of the same way in Chelsea that sure. I wouldn't be, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Spurs Twitter has been, like, losing its mind, like, pretty much since Nuno's appointment. Like, right. And everyone liked him at first. You know, right. oh, man, what a breath of fresh air. And a good start at first. Also. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, Premier League Manager of the Month for the month of mm-hmm. August. Um, to getting it was one of the tweets of like the, no, it was a counselor like uh, images that preceded unfortunate <laughs> events. Yeah, right. Um, and yet here we are in November, and he is sitting on the outside looking in like the rest of us. Um, so yeah, it was very much like the outside world was looking at at Ole. But sure. I think both sets of fan bases internally are like losing their minds for a while. Well, I mean, now. you you pointed that out. So it, United win this match three nil. It's just going away. Spurs going through the motions of the whole match. Just oh, didn't they, look in it. Oh, so bad. But, so, Nuno makes a substitution late in the second half that the fans did not like. Mm-hmm. And he then proceeded to get showered with a chorus of, you don't know what you're doing. Oh, yeah. It was specifically, I know the sub, and it was the one, it, I mean, I was kind of thinking the same thing. He hauled off Lucas Mora. For Steven Bergwijn. When, when you needed a goal. When we needed a goal. And Lucas Moore is like one of those players that gives you that for right. Spurs often. And he's, it, he's scored some pretty famous goals. Yeah, uh, there's like that hat trick in, in Amsterdam that, that turned out all right. Um, it just, yeah, that, that, I think that was the turning point, really. Like, the that really was. And, you know, getting spanked at home by right. anyone is, is never a good look, but... <clears throat> Um, I, I think it was, I heard this on the football ramble. Someone said, like, when you lose to a team that's, like, under the spotlight, it, like, suddenly shifts the spotlight over to you. Right. Right? And like, oh, crap, I'm in it now. Well, I mean, there was a great, uh, there was a really good tweet from one of the guys uh, that actually covers Chelsea mainly. Um, and it's what I, t- I titled our, our, our segment here when I gave you the rundown of Ole basically handed the crisis baton over to Spurs like yeah, now it's your turn yeah they were calling this match what the El Sakiko uh ahead, <laughs> ahead of it so that does give you an, loser, some insight into loser like loser goes home yeah and it does give you some of the insight like there was some pressure on Nuno like heading into this too like in I order guess, yeah for that. I guess like just from the an outsider perspective I just didn't I didn't realize we were already there. Yeah. And he's so likable, right? Like sure. he's just like a likable sure. dude and he's so friendly. He seems like your your friendly neighborhood like you know grandpa that's He like, just seemed like yeah. He seemed like that cool youth coach that like everybody mm. everybody wants to chat up at the at, at the fields and Yeah. He's always doing the right things and like his teams are always great and he's all the all the kids like him. And then he had a bad year. <laughs> he had a bad year. Yeah, and that's where some they parents are. ran him off. Yeah, um, I do think he was his situation was almost untenable from the start, right? Like, yeah. So I mean, I I saw some people mention this. Like, did the fact that he was it was well known that he he was essentially like the yeah I always joke like the seventh option, but like the fourth or fifth option the club had looked into. Yeah. I mean, how did the players get behind that? 
I don't, right? I don't think they do, right? Well, I mean, it did appear that they didn't. I, I, I agree. Like, outside of that Manchester City match uh, at the beginning of the season, mm-hmm. this team's never looked like it was headed in the same direction. Uh, we've talked at length about how it seemed like a, a squad in transition and, you know, people just pointed in different directions in general. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think... It, the wheels appeared to fall off fast because maybe they weren't really even attached, right? Like it's, it's like you took all the wheels off and then put them back on, but didn't tighten on any of the lug nuts up, and so it just like, like you start driving and, like, <laughs> and then it all of a sudden, boom, and you're on the ground. And I think that's what happened to Nuno, and it's unfortunate, but here we are. Um, so we, I mean, it, it it's pretty clear, and honestly, explains some of the performances we've seen from some of the bigger names on that squad that the players just didn't buy in yeah i mean i think think that's accurate it almost if you think about it is kind of a relief about the harry kane situation right because now you can clearly go well maybe that's it maybe that's why he's kind of looked like a a guy that's just kind of been (laughs) i'm about to go to manchester halfway there and then you're like, and I've got this clown that I have to Pep Guardiola this to is, yeah to this guy who's got three names. Like, what is this all about? <laughs> and yeah, maybe that's part of it. And I'm I'm certainly hoping that's the case. Sure. But the nice part is, is like now that we know who's in to replace Nuno, like that attitude ain't gonna fly any longer. Uh yeah. So let's move to that. So Antonio Conte, um. I believe essentially choice one B one a was Pochettino returns, which was really an insane proposition from the start. Yeah. And I, mean, I don't think it was ever really that real. Well, I know. And then that whole messy thing happened and he's like, yeah, I'm going to probably mm. try to probably gonna, try to gonna take, see this one out, take a crack at this guy. <laughs> um, but as, essentially one of the top options, uh, a guy that had essentially, I mean, had the conversations, had the interviews, had the chats with uh, uh, the, the management there at Spurs. I guess ha- has some familiarity with uh, the new tactical or technical director. Uh, yeah, I believe they may have worked together in the past in Italy. Um, and I think this was his top target as far as like what they wanted or what he uh patrici or our um, our italian technical director had wanted out of the the managerial situation so i think that's like good i think if anything you look at the situation and you go man did conte play his cards right because it seemed like he got pretty far down the line with spurs last time around Mm -hmm. and then where it really fell apart is like what he wanted out of the situation and what spurs were going to give him and now like, I don't think they were in a position to tell him no. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, well, shit. Because they don't get him. Like, what you doing now? I mean, yeah, you can't see my eyes right now, but it's kind of like, wh- where are you going? And so th- you have to pretty much give Conte the keys to the car and say, like, D- do it. Like, do your thing. And his track record of, like, coming in into this exact type of situation is damn near flawless. So it's like, okay, sh- sure. And it, what's really encouraging is, like, the sticking point seemed to be last time, spend. Like, how much backing is he actually going to get? And I can't imagine Conte came without that promise. Yeah, and you're and you're right. I think, I think that's a good point. Uh, Spurs had lost the leverage at this point. If they wanted him, whatever he needed, whatever they needed to tell him and promise him to get him to sign that contract... They kind of had to do, right? Because yeah. it's the man they wanted. It's the really only good move out there on the table. I thought it was a pretty good You one. had to make it happen. Yeah. Also, puts United in a bit of a situation. Because oh, now their, their plan, and it sounded like Conte had, you know, had basically vocalized that he was interested in the position, if available. You know, now if United does have to pull the ripcord, they don't exactly have uh, they don't exactly have that option that they thought they had. Well, I think it's like uh, a great example of Spurs like failing upwards. You know what I mean? Like, oh, 
we've lost but won the won the war you know what i mean like right. we, we we lost the battle but won the war um i also think this is a testament to to like <laughs> loser gets conte right yeah right <laughs> but also like spurs they took the action that united have been too big of pussies to do you know what i mean yeah. like they oh no no i i i definitely have this in my notes like so ole survives but like are the is the board going to look back at that liverpool loss and be like Shoot, that was our moment. Mm-hmm. We should have pulled. Why didn't we pull the trigger then? And now we don't have the guy we wanted. Because I like he, <laughs> they kind of screwed themselves. You wonder. You wonder if there's like a naivety or like a, a a hubris in that they're like, well, listen, if he's weighing us and Spurs, like he'll give it. You know, we could wait through right. this weekend. Like, of course, he'll turn down Spurs because he knows we're there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you would think maybe that played a part. Who knows? I mean, we're not in those conversations. But, um, but let's let's talk Conte for a second because he obviously brings in, um, you know, obviously brings in the pedigree. Mm-hmm. He's he's managed in the Premier League for two seasons. Uh, in those two seasons, he won a trophy both seasons. He won the Premier League right out the gate. Won thirty matches in that season, and then the following year they won the FA Cup. That would be dope. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. We'll yeah. take, take one of those. Yeah. I mean, I how do I how do I make that happen? Uh, I mean? Well, you you let him bring in some people. Yeah. Um, that he'll eventually run off. Yes. Yeah. Um, that but like this is a manager that I think it was the Men and Blazers talking about. Like this is a kind of a return to what Pochettino brought. That it's a guy that's going to demand a lot out of his players, and. The Mourinho thing was the Mourinho thing. The Nuno was the was basically non-existent. But like, you could contend that like the squad hasn't been put through the ringer like that from a manager since Pochettino left. Oh, for sure. But, yeah, I think it's a different ringer that Mourinho puts you through. It's more of a mental one. Yeah. To a certain extent, there. Um, yeah, I mean, I I, I like it. Because, like, he's going to be... I, there was a great, like, a great... Uh, as soon as this, you know, the it seemed like it was a done deal. Someone tweeted out, um, you know, Deli Ali on yes. Conte's first day. <laughs> and it was the and clip was from, the, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Remember the Remember Titans. Remember the Titans, yeah. And it's of the, the hot shot running back, and he's just smiling. He's got his hand up. And Denzel Washington just trains over to him. And is like, actor. put your hand down. And, like... They go through this whole spiel about where, having fun. About having fun, and like at the end of it, he's like, "Football is no longer fun." Like you know, no it, fun. There no is fun, no, no fun here. And it, I mean, that's the attitude. Like yeah. I want, like hell yeah, give me that. Like I need that because after the last year and a half of ups and downs, like I don't want, I don't want anything less than like demand excellence. And if we're gonna get anything out of this generation of players that we have. Now, like, squeeze them for all you got. You got to do it. And my my only real concern is like I don't know that we have the personnel to play the way that he typically plays. Like, sure, if we're gonna play three in the back, which is kind of like a trademark of Conte's system. I'm a little skeptical that we have the players currently to do that. I mean, I feel like that's a direct shot at Eric Dyer, and I I just don't know if I'll stand for that. I it was it was definitely a direct shot at Eric Dyer. I it's the type of thing I would say about Eric Dyer as long as he's not standing in the room because that would be terrifying. Right. Like I I would be afraid to say that around him. I mean, as long as you don't say something about his brother or yell at his brother, right? Yeah, was that, that that's why he ran into the stands that, that is, one time yeah. to yeah possibly try to fist fight somebody? I mean, kind of would have loved it actually. Um, Conte. <sighs> Listen, he demands a lot. He gets a lot out of players. He does burn dudes out, though. Yeah. I mean, like, I think we always talk about that with Mourinho, but, like, I feel like Conte does that. He's almost worse at it. Oh, it's only a two-year deal. Maybe they knew that. Well, <laughs> took, a, took a page out of Chelsea. Like, hey, you get it two years, and that second one, you're going to get a trophy, but it's going to end with four- to five-year players Literally wanting nothing to do with the man. Sounds fine with me. There are a couple that I'd be all right to <laughs> ship him off at the hey, end of that. Um, he, you guys are already on the same page. Mm-hmm. Uh, Conte, much like most Spurs supporters, uh, hates Willian. Good. It's, it's perfect. Uh, 
he ran off Diego Costa, so he hates that guy too. Okay. So I mean, all the things you guys are in, yeah. into. So hey, listen, what I love most, he spent he spent the first two nights with the club sleeping at the training ground. Ah, uh, so good. That's you like, it's the type of propaganda that like your fans eat up, and I'm like, oh yeah. Give me that, like more, like right into my veins. Remember, AVB had that like sleeping pod that he had at Chelsea that I'm sure he also brought to to Spurs. Maybe that's still there. He did. They had multiple of them. Maybe the players... maybe that was that he left them, and that's what Conte slept in. <laughs> AVB's pods. Perhaps. Oh man, that's just really going back. It's mm. just the links between our clubs. Love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say last. Uh, we've, we've this is the third manager we've shared in the last decade. Goodness gracious. I mean, it's probably saying something that we're trying to ape your stuff here. Wow. Yeah. Um. So you're excited, though. Very. That. This. I mean, we talked about it. He obviously was demanding a lot. That. You know, management pretty much had to say, "Okay, yeah, fine, we'll do that." So does that mean you guys are going to be January players? Like, as far as the window goes. I mean, I think if we were in a be successful this year and I think this move is partly driven by a desire to get them into fourth right like I think sure that's an open grab potentially certainly to get you out of conference league uh, yeah um but if they're gonna do that like they're gonna have to pick up some pieces and there's been a lot of talk about some of the names that he wants to bring in alongside to, to make that happen and I think defensively is probably where things will will start off and we'll see where things go from there I would imagine he probably is going to be looking for another holding midfielder of some sorts, but I mean, who knows? I, I do, I do think though there there was an expectation that Spurs would spend, and I think they kind of have come to the realization too, like, hey, if we're going to do this, like, we actually have to we're <laughs> we're going to have to do it and like spend like the big boys if we're going to pretend to be one. I mean, you got a big boy manager; he expects big boy movement, right? That's right. Uh, the other side of the coin here, Ole. Mm. We do have to talk about this situation. He sur- he survives another scare. He now gets this nice win. Um, they also clawed back and got a draw against uh, Atalanta, I believe it was, this this midweek. Yeah. Um, people will harangue that. That's a better result than, than most people, I think, sure. would think it would sure. be. Um, I mean, is this guy ever going to lose this job? Starting to look like no, like he always does just enough to stay, You're just like, enough. Just you, when you think it's oh, it's like oh, here the writing's on the wall. He has run out of runway. What would he it take? Done. What would it take for him? Like what would it take? I honestly think it would take them getting like pantsed by like a Southampton or something like that, or a lesser club than that. I'm for that. If they lose two nil to Norwich. He. Like a Josh Sargent they brace. They pound his car in the parking lot and just tell him to walk home. Well, we thought that might be what happened when he got four nilled at halftime against Liverpool. <clears throat> yeah. Again, I feel like that board is going to get to February. They will have like maybe plateaued. They're like barely hanging on to like a fourth place spot, and the board's going to be like, "We had our chance." Like, we had the golden opportunity to just roll them, and it made all the sense in the world. Nah, Ole will come good. Everything will be fine. Um, yeah, that, uh, all right. Uh, moving on. Uh, the other matches this weekend that weren't big matches yet ended up being kind of big deals. Uh, Manchester City lose, 10-man Manchester City lose to Crystal Palace. Big result there. For Patrick Vieira, bad result there for Pep Guardiola. Yeah, in his two um, hundredth match in charge of City as well. Congratulations. Definitely not how he pictured that one going down. I would no, imagine. No, 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 no. Mm. That's like uh, when you you schedule your homecoming against like a the worst team in your area, and then you they get they they smack you. And you're like, what? And you're like, that's not how this was supposed to go at all. This isn't reality. Uh, it was his reality this weekend. Uh, Vieira's boys putting together a bit of a run here. Um, the decent results. Look at, should have had that win versus Arsenal. Yeah, they really should have. Um, like, I mean, really owned that match uh, and then gave it away there at the end. Yeah, but he's he's given them more body than I really expected he might. Yeah. Um, and I've 
you know, as someone who secretly liked Vieira as a player, even though I'm not supposed to like him, um, I I was deep down pulling, and we have a little bit of an affinity here for for Palace and the Queen City, and yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I think uh, I, I'm I'm definitely pulling for him to to do well with him, and this is obviously I think the the crowning achievement of his reign there so far. So big big implications for for Palace as they try to stay safe and and keep themselves up in the league. Obviously, that's a, a yearly challenge for them to an extent, but also big you know title implications potentially as this gives a little bit of breathing room at the top of the table. A little bit more breathing room, we should say, between you know Chelsea, who have been setting the pace, and Liverpool, who even managed to drop some points this weekend as well. Yeah, so Liverpool, uh, everything was going great. Great first half. They're up 2-0. Uh, they give up a goal towards halftime and then end up drawing 2-2 uh, with Graham Potter uh, in a weekend where you're... You know, obviously, had the contact thing not happen, you sit there and go, so maybe Graham Potter was the hire oh, that should have happened. Not <laughs> sure who's feeling better about this, you know, the whole Ole getting the win thing. Uh, Spurs fans, who ended up with the manager they preferred to begin with. Sure. Uh, or Brighton, who now are like, whew, they're not going to be circling Graham, uh, it, it, you know, for the next few weeks. He stays. Yeah. For now. Yeah. Until... I mean, what United wouldn't hire him? No, Graham Ars- Potter. That's not sexy enough for Manchester United. Arsenal. I mean, I don't even think they would do that. They, yeah, Leicester City. There you go. That could. If be someone it. comes for B. Raj, Leicester, call him the Potter. But is that that much of a step up? You know what I mean? Like, I mean, obviously it is in the grand scheme of things right now. Yeah. But couldn't he maybe build Brighton in? Some, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. <sighs> I feel like this. Why do the work when it's already been done for you, I right? I suppose that's true. That is true. Um, so Liverpool draw, City draw. You mentioned it. Uh, Chelsea now sit five points above City. Uh, three points. I think it's three points. Three points yeah. above uh, Liverpool, so create a little bit of a, I mean, a very minimal gap, a gap that can still be erased within a week. Uh, yes, very easily. So, uh, still that. Uh, Chelsea, we can move on to that. Uh, we kind of whip around the league. Chelsea roll uh, at St. James's Park, something they are not accustomed to doing. Um, this has generally been like a match that they always screw up. Weird. They've, oh, I mean, they have for years got pipped. At St. James's Park, it's always been just a, uh, just kind of a, a, I don't know, it's just kind of their, <laughs> kind of their Everest in a way. A little, right? little b- boogeyman, Everest. Yeah, is a little ev- bit of boogeyman. Everest is it's just a difficult thing. It is uh, uh, of late. Some people can climb it, some people can't. Yeah, and some people who think they're there aren't actually on it right. at all. Um, I, I think the other funny, funny part too, Spurs are linked a little bit in this way to Newcastle as well. We also tend to do very poorly against them, mm-hmm. but at home, like we tend to, oh okay, dr- drop points at home against Newcastle. So keeping this weird little thing between our clubs going, but um, yeah, this uh, obviously the expected result if you want to like look at the paper, right? right? Three nil, so. uh, Reese James getting a getting a brace. Uh, weird. St. Reese James Park? Yeah. Oh. All right, Dad. I mean, everyone was already making yeah, that sure. joke right away. Yeah. Um, um, also, a bit of a sign, like, they may be the richest club in the world now, but they have a lot of work to do. A lot. Yeah. Like, they need to make a lot of transactions in January. Uh, you're hearing the latest managerial name being linked to St. James's Park at the moment? No. Who is it? Former Arsenal manager and potential vampire. Ooh, good evening. Yeah. I'm all in for that. Yeah, right? Bring that guy back. Yeah. So just a little bit of, you know, the, the links that are going down, which I find it's an odd... I think he's coaching, like, a Champions League squad right now. or It's like Villarreal, right? Yeah, I think so. Which, I mean, seems like you're trading up, trading down a little bit, but... I mean, you're trading for a bigger project. Uh, For sure. And, you know, the expectation that if you go down and get canned, you probably are going to get, like, a massive severance. Win. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, 
Yeah, it. Yeah, I mean Newcastle. Maybe wasn't the time to buy them. <laughs> or maybe this is the time to buy them. Like buy them, buy them when their stock's low. I mean, it's not like you got a. They got like a deal. They didn't get like a discount on them. I don't know. And some MLS teams are valued at like twice the selling price. Well, those are all just bogus numbers, also. Well, okay. Are any of those clubs even turning profits? I mean, what are we talking about here? I, I don't know. What What is this? Uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of million dollar TV deal that they're tied into. Uh, okay, and, well, yeah, here, exactly. here we'll give it a better perspective. Uh, it costs like two Neymars. Okay, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, that's that's a good comparison. Yeah. Um. Uh, real quickly though, for Chelsea, um, another clean sheet. Chelsea in first place, and I gotta say, like, what I really like about this Chelsea side this year is this is this is Chelsea going back to their bread and butter, right? Like they are a team that just doesn't concede goals. I mean, it does seem that way to an extent. That was the glory days, right? You're not blowing just... teams out, right? You know, for the most part, obviously, unless this is you're a Norwich. big one. Um, <laughs> but like, yeah, I mean, th- there is an element of that. Like Tuchel has the um, an element that reminds me of like the surgical precision of like the Chelsea sides. Like they mm-hmm. they knew what their game plan was and they were going to execute. Yeah, it. and they just stay on that course. Yeah, like screw the glory hunting, like you know. Stat, stat packing, whatever. We're going for the heavy stuff. And uh, so far, so good. Yeah, it, it seems to be working out for two show. Um, other things. So, uh, Arsenal. We mentioned Le- Lesser City. The job might be open, and and maybe it is. I don't know. But um, Lesser City fall because Arsenal finally get what I would say their first like good win of the yeah. Season. I would say so. Maybe too. the yeah. And it's, it is over, like, a wounded dog. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, Leicester or not the Leicester that we're used to. What was the better win, that or the Spurs match? Eh, I mean, I, I bet their fans would go with the Spurs match. Sure. This one feels, From the outsider perspective. Yeah. The Spurs one, I think, because it shifted the momentum for them. Also because I feel like it's become too commonplace for Arsenal to be crap and yet still get the win in that in that match. Yes. Like they still show up and find the W. 100%. So like I almost discount it for that. Yeah. Where like the Leicester City match like these are two teams that are trying to you know, right the ship on their season, get going, contend for one of those uh European positions. So th- this I felt like this match had more of a like dogfight mentality. And Credit to them. They go on the road. They get a 2-0 victory. Um, solid. Are, is Arsenal okay? Like, are they going to be all right? I don't want to admit that, but maybe. I don't. Here's the thing. I People are trying to say, like, oh, you know, Arteta's finally, you know, his system's kind of working. What What is their system? Um, I mean, that's, that's uh, kind of my... My like viewpoint on it is like I mean they're they're playing better sure but I don't I, I they're still a team that I feel like lacks identity and you know that's not necessarily the worst thing in the world but I don't I don't see them achieving much if anything. Fair. Uh, any other res- results that you wanted to kind of hit on from the from the weekend? Uh, I mean. Not, I mean, nothing was overly interesting. I'm sure someone will probably take offense to that, but well, the only about this, yeah, sure. The the one thing I will say though is seven away teams won this weekend. That's the highest tally I think so far this year, which okay. is kind of an amazing. You just don't see that very often. The Premier League the home field advantage is strong in the Premier League, especially now that the fans are back. Um, so just a, a bit of an unexpected little series of events that that followed there, but. No, it was a it was a good Premier League weekend. I was, I really enjoyed this one. I felt like there were a lot of fun games to watch in it. Yeah, and given that the rain like really rained all over my like own coaching this weekend, it gave me a, a chance to watch a lot of soccer. So Season was, ended, right? You're uh, we, I think we've got a couple little things, maybe some makeups to do. Oh, but, that's fine. Yeah, our, our 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 my daughter's season came to an end on on Sunday. 
Mm-hmm. You know, they were in, they made it to the semifinals in a tournament, and uh, the field they played on, half the field was just a pile of. I mean, it was just mud. Oh, it was crazy. just a mud pit. It's that time of year in Cincinnati. Like I literally had to like tell the girls like, "Hey guys, see see the other team warming up on that part, side of the field. See how the ball like literally stops right in front of the goal." So that means you got to follow that shot and just keep kicking at it because it's going. just not going to move. It is not going anywhere. It's not like you are just going to have to scoop that thing out with your feet. Yeah. Because it's not going anywhere at all. Uh, things that are going somewhere, MLS playoffs, they're coming up. Uh, yeah, decision day this Sunday. Um, I, it's it's weird. I, I'm going to be at the match uh, for FC Cincinnati's finale. No decisions um, being made there, huh? N- uh, not at least as far as they're concerned. Yes, that's very true. Uh, but, like, part of me is like, ah, crap. Like, I kind of want to, like, be able to, like, pay attention to all the other matches, but I'll, like, be at a match, so it's a little, a little hard to do that. But um, we head into the final match day. Uh, matches wrapping up tonight. There was some matches to kind of mm-hmm. get everybody on to 33 matches into the final uh, decision day Sunday. Um, out East, there's not too many teams alive. No. Uh, I mean, so technically speaking, Columbus in tenth place is still alive. DC United in ninth place still alive. Montreal is definitely alive. They're one point back of the Red Bulls, who get a nil-nil draw with uh, Atlanta tonight. Mm-hmm. Um, a wi- had the Red Bulls won, uh, that would have pretty much killed off anybody but Montreal. Yeah. Um, DC United and Columbus are alive, but, like, not really. Yeah. I mean, they, like, need everything to go their direction. Right. They need the Red Bulls to lose by a couple goals. They have to then win by several goals. Um, It would take... It takes a lot of moving pieces for that to happen. Uh, Columbus Crew has found out that they're going to be playing against part of a team. A weakened (laughs) Chicago Fire. Portions. Um, Chicago, gonna, you know, it's funny. Outside. FCC, while like definitely carrying the banner as like the biggest clown show in Major League Soccer, yes. Chicago regularly is like, but wait, Don't consider forget. us. Yeah. Consider us as well. We are legacy clowns. Uh, yeah, we our clowndom stretches back decades at this point. Um, they There's an annual thing at the end of MLS seasons where you, as a club, will let players on your team know... Whether you're going to be picking up their options or not next right. year, right? And Which, generally speaking, I think Chris Albright mentioned this like a week ago, uh, talking to our friend Laurel Fowler. Um, for the most part, those contracts, the way they're built, like they basically have to like the end of November, yep, to sort out like, are we gonna retain you? Are we letting you roll? Maybe we'll help you. Maybe we'll use you as an asset, but right. just know that you're probably leaving or, you know, whatever. Um, Chicago shows a different route where instead of using the off season that is essentially, you know, the remainder of November after after this weekend, uh, they informed players, I guess, today or yesterday, this week, essentially this week, heading into the final match day of the season, they informed players uh, that they weren't getting their options picked up or they weren't going to be retained in whatever way their contract was built. Um, and the majority of those players have said, well, all right, well, I guess we'll see you. Like, no, no, we got, we got a match on Sunday. Like, ah, huh. turns out I'm, I'm not busy. part of this anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm busy doing, you don't what are you need gonna be me, doing? Right? I'm, I'm going to be washing my hair. Yeah. Um, you don't need me. You've already told me that. Yeah. Uh, seven players they've informed that apparently six of those players are regular starters. Mm. Um, so the crew may be in a position to put a little get, bit get of a hurting down get a big and, one. and get a big one in and, and maybe, uh, you know, see a decision day result, go their direction. But yeah, I think their odds are still pretty long, even with Chicago trying to <sighs> torpedo themselves from the inside. Yeah. Now, I mean, Nashville is uh, hosting Red Bulls, so Red Bulls have to go on the road to Nashville to end the season. So, I mean, they could conceivably like, they lose that 2-0. That would then uh, put them on 47 points. Goal differential of uh, would be like plus four then at that point. The crew, uh, gosh, they would still need to win like 
six nothing. Yeah, I mean they they need a big one. So it's not impossible, but odds are looking long for our neighbors right. to the north. Essentially, the same situation for DC United. They're they're on the same thing, except their goal differential is currently stands at zero instead of negative one, like the crew. So I. Logically, both of them are out. Montreal could still remain. Oddly enough, Montreal's still in the playoff hunt, despite the fact that I believe they let go of the GM this week. Uh, they did, yeah. So, a very chaotic season for Montreal. Their coach resigns three days before the season. And... Right, and then they fire their uh, GM just days before they might make the playoffs. Yeah, uh, tough game for them, though, uh, facing Orlando at home. Orlando, obviously, uh, still very much in the playoff hunt as well um and and potentially if they lose this game to montreal and dc or columbus get a result well i mean if they lose that game yeah they if montreal game, wins obviously and then the red bulls get a win over nashville yeah they could see themselves orlando's out. out yeah right like and it's wild because we've been talking all year about how orlando or like how oh, they finally got their act together and they have really just the last month or so just cratered mm-hmm. and you wonder if they have enough in them to to get over the the finish line like this is a a really tricky game for them in montreal and you know if it weren't for the fact that montreal have only won once in their last five games i think they would be pretty nervous about the situation and probably still are to a certain extent um that's it for the east out west Things are, are somewhat tight. So you have uh, Minnesota and Vancouver on 48 points. Galaxy on 47 points. That rounds out your your 5, 6, and 7th playoff spot. Right behind them, though, is Salt Lake, who we just saw lose emphatically to Portland uh, and kill off their goal differential. They now stand at a goal differential of zero. And then LAFC. Again, LAFC is still on the outside looking in. If they get a win, which they play Colorado in Colorado, a very good Colorado side, but possibly a Colorado side that's not looking to get anybody hurt. They essentially can't really improve their spots too terribly. I guess they eh, I guess they can. I mean they could they could potentially take first. They're place getting in a the home they're getting a home uh, home game though, right? They are gonna get a home game. They won't get the buy, and you know, that's obviously what they'll be right. eyeballing the most. But I think, you know, they they I wouldn't be shocked if they took the you know the the approach of let's just play it safe. We've already got this home game locked up. Like we'll just go into it. So LAFC will be fighting for their lives, and Colorado you know may not have as much to play for in that particular right. scenario. But you know the, I think the big game for this weekend at least is LA Galaxy and where they lie. They'll be facing a Minnesota side that you know. It was right next to him in the standings. Yeah, right. Like there's there's just a lot, a lot to potentially move around in there, and I think that's you mentioned that the Western Conference was tight, and that's where it's tight is like the teams that are currently in could shift around a lot depending on how the results go, and you could see with a win both Salt Lake or LAFC catching up with them from a points perspective. So there's just a, a out west. I think is going to be really interesting that that slate of 6 p.m. games is going to be fun and I'm going to do everything possible to make sure that I'm able to watch that live. So outside of Portland, Portland's playing Austin to end to end the season. Austin obviously not factoring in as one does in their first season in, in MLS. Um, <clears throat> everybody else, nine or one through nine is playing someone else in contention for either improving their spot, solidifying their spot, getting a spot so out west basically all but like three of your matches two of your matches uh like really matter mls has got to be liking this it's working out well for them like there there are like probably what seven eight games that like sure matter this weekend considering them. this is a season where your supporter shield like was locked up super early yeah um, it is good that they do still have a lot on the line. Indeed. Um, winners and wankers. I think that's the part of the show we're at. Let me uh, let me get your uh, let me get your winner. My winner, 
Or your week. wanker. I'm sorry. We go yeah, with wankers. We'll, we'll let's do with wankers. Uh, first, uh, that's yeah. Fine. yeah, let's start with the negative. Uh, we'll go close to home. Uh, FC Cincinnati uh, doing their normal thing of badness. As they do. As they do. Um, and, and, you know, here's hoping this is the last time that we can give them the wanker award, at least from a playing perspective in the, in the near future. You know, they'll get a few months off and, and be able to step away from the limelight and let Chris Albright do his thing. Marks will be here quicker than But they did set another MLS record this week, oh, and the fantastic. worst kind of one. Uh, they set the longest losing streak in league history at 11 matches. Yay! 11 matches without a point. Yeah. That's and I just, paid to see several of those. Oh, geez. I mean, I'm sorry <laughs> for your money. Um, I mean, not my, technically my company paid yeah, to see well, several. Someone those. paid for it. Um, it's just that's it's comically bad. And for a club whose president was proclaiming that people didn't make it to Everest with him, well, if this is Everest, <laughs> that Jeff Birding's full of shit. Uh, yeah, old Sir Edmund Hillary over there. Yeah. Um. My wanker. It's not a political statement. This is not me endorsing anything. But everybody on Twitter, on the Twitter.com, that had to get big mad about Mitt Romney dressing up as right. Ted Lasso. Like, guys, it's okay. okay. I, a guy you don't like likes a thing you like. That's how the world operates. They really did get <laughs> Really bothered by it. Super bothered. I Super bothered. Am I a big Mitt Romney fan? No. But you know what? I don't care that he enjoyed Halloween yeah. like everyone else. And then, like, he did it because Jason Sudeikis played him on SNL. Yeah. So he was he was returning. I, I think he was returning that, the favor. Dude, that's funny. That's it's funny. fine. That's funny. It's fine. You don't have to just because you don't like his politics. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean you can't just go like, ah, okay, all right, good on you, man. Hey, how about that? I'm mad still that he saved the the Winter Olympics. There was literally Salt Lake City. Are you mad about that? No, I'm not at all. I, I love feel the like Winter that's Olympics. actually like a I love thing, the like a universally I'm, I'm really good thing it. that he did. I'm really glad he did it. Really, I'm actually um, happy. But I, I mean, there was literally like an article written about how like did it was like did Mitt Romney ruin Ted Lasso oh, for you? God, and I'm like if if. If that is what ruins a show for you, we have bigger issues. We have so much, so yeah, such bigger issues. With yeah, you then. that's right. I'm. That's a great. Gracious. That's a great wanker award. Soccer Twitter. It was just so like it was deserves like, more wanker awards, but that's yet, that's just a really good one. And the worst part about it was, it was so predictable. Oh yeah, it was so. The second I saw that. Mitt Romney's tweet. I was like, "Oh, dude, people are gonna soccer people Twitter are going to be like all this. in a fit over this." Yeah, it's weird. Soccer Twitter, uh, just up in a heap yeah. about something at all times. Never, never. Yeah, it's just not what they do. All right, uh, your winner. My winner this week. I'm going uh, to someone who I've really enjoyed watching play over the years. Has mm-hmm. finally announced that he's hanging up his boots. Buster Posey. Uh, no, not Buster Posey. Okay. Um, Peepa. Federico Iguain yeah. has announced his retirement at the age of 37. Uh, obviously, he spent the last season and a half down in Miami with his brother. You know, is he going to do like the cool like American sports things? thing that we used to do, where like he's going to sign a one day contract with the crew so he can retire a crew? I, I mean, I'd be all right with that. The That'd crew have done cool. that before, I think. Sure. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. So they should okay definitely offer that. it. I think it'd be smart of them to at least offer it. Yeah, I mean, he he certainly is a club legend in Columbus. And, Fly him and in, have a little ceremony that. or a little, little moment, a yeah, little press I'd, moment there I'd, in the off season. I'd be all for that. Set paper and, over uh, the fact that you didn't make the playoffs. <laughs> you know, there's there's something to do there. Um, but yeah, a great career brought brought the city of Columbus a championship during his time. Um, you know, just something that you you have to you have to appreciate him as a player and. Uh, probably one of the most underrated players uh, during the entirety of his spell in Major League Soccer. So, yeah. Hats off to Pipa. Uh, an absolute MLS legend. Yeah. My winner, not an MLS legend, but a man who 
continues to earn my respect. And I just realized that both my winner and wanker is going to paint me in one certain way uh, politically, but oh, whatever, boy. I'll just handle that heat. Oh, uh, it's, it's Jeff Cameron and not for any of the things that uh, you have now just thought of, Whew. but the fact that he just took, just didn't even bat an eye when he won out about flaming all of his complacent teammates after the match this past weekend. It was good. I mean, and, he put long overdue. And he put some certain dudes on blast. Uh, Lucho Acosta being ex- like exclusively the first like 30 seconds of that. Um which I mean, I really want to say I've taken some legitimate heat online for calling out Acosta as being like a genuinely bad player and like not good for any team that's trying to advance <sighs> themselves. Yeah. Look, you can talk about his stats all day long, like you you can. But he gets those he, stats because of his selfishness. Yeah. Uh, I I forget I, the just the terrible matches that I saw live uh, are all blurring together. Uh, I I can't remember if it's the uh, if it was the I think it was the Orlando match. And he, the amount of times that he literally physically ran with the ball straight into the back line of Orlando and lost possession was so maddening every single time instead of making the pass instead of doing he literally just kept dribbling and dribbling until he physically ran straight into his center back and lost the ball or like times where he hangs on the ball forever and then finally gives it up after taking like 45 touches and then has to play it all the way back to like yeah like Harris like that <laughs> like, or do, or um he's not happy with like that person not being able to do anything with it and he'll be mad that the ball didn't come back to him or whatever and it's like dude you broke everything to make it all get there like yeah of course there was no outlet to pass to because uh everyone had to make nine runs to adjust to your one possession so yeah um Jeff definitely called him out and I, I do wish I wish that he just used names. Like if I had a complaint. Well, there. I mean, he did explain the whole wearing a ca- the significance of wearing a captain's armband, how he has the experience of wearing the captain's armband, and what's expected when you wear the captain's armband. Yes, yeah. And considering the only other person who had worn that captain's armband this season was Lucho Acosta, that one was pretty much telegraphed. I, I'm gonna. Be the honest. rest of it, though, he was super vague on. Like yeah. he definitely talked about just. You know, runs not being made, mm-hmm. uh, not dropping back, not defending. Uh, you know, I mean, he he called out some things that we all sat there and go, yeah, yeah, that's constantly happening yeah, whatever, all season long. But whatever Fox News, Jeremy. All I'm saying <laughs> is good to see Virginia do what they do. <laughs> oh God, here we go. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> I hate both parties with yeah. passion. Yeah, both all of everyone sucks. Yeah. Everyone sucks. Um No, that's I think that was a, a great call out. Jeff I think that was the first time I've really not that I have not been impressed with what he's brought to the team, but that was like the steal in mentality that I've really been like looking for out of him. Yeah. So Hopefully that captain's arm man stays on his arm next year. One would hope. And not Yeah, the other guy. Yeah. Uh, I bring. I think that brings us to the end of this week's show. Did you do your winner? I kind of blacked out there. I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was it a good one? It was. It was great. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, if you want to be as engaged as Jeremy is in our show, uh, get Oops. get get in touch. Yeah, he's at Jeremy Lance on Twitter. I'm at Wrong Side of Pond, and uh, we'll talk about a new topic next week that's unrelated to soccer. I'm sure. It's our new thing. Christmas trees pre. Free Thanksgiving. Right. Yes or no? Yeah, all right. Uh, soon enough. I mean, you might show up to my house next weekend and already get that answer. Fully expecting that, no doubt. All right, folks. Bye. Bye.